I arrived in Moskosel in early February 2023, sent by a property developer to undertake initial surveying at the proposed site of a data center destined to serve the cloud architecture of multiple European logistics companies. I had been on an afternoon flight from Stockholm with a group of executives and board members from a forestry conglomerate. They seemed nervous and discussed with some wariness the threat posed by a new AI-driven startup that had apparently already made significant headway in the space and claimed to be able to calculate with some accuracy from satellite data alone the extractive potential of different landscapes. I tuned in and out passively to their conversation as the light slowly drained from the sky outside the plane window and began to flicker in solitary pockets on the ground below. After an hour, it was announced we were descending towards Arvidsjaur, which could now be seen illuminated out the left-hand side of the cabin. At the airport, I collected my bags and filed onto the minibus heading towards Moskosel. Travelling in this direction were only a few couples and a young man who, as we began to talk, told me he came up here three or four times a year and always for a few weeks in winter, when the dry cold cleared his head and allowed him to work on his writing projects. The winter is usually pretty quiet, he noted, with the busiest time of year being late summer after the deer hunting season had begun, but when the light was still present late into the evening. The weather was nonetheless warm for what should have been the coldest month of the year, Snow dropped in great clumps from the boughs of trees as we approached the village, whose lights began to glow through the woods as we got closer. We arrived in a floodlit car park next to a small supermarket, out of whose single door spilled a warm light. I had been reserved a room in a B&B, located in the same building as the supermarket on the first floor. I checked into my room, which looked out the back of the building into the woods, now inscrutable in the darkness. Leaving my bags unpacked by the door, I fell down on the bed and went to sleep. When I woke in the morning, it was still dark. Through the window, the woods seemed cold and dense. I took my coat down from where it hung by the door and descended the stairs to the reception area and out the front door into the car park, where the minivan still stood from the night before. I peered through the grubby grey light that now sank from the sky. Across the car park there stood a dark angular boulder, jutting out of the smooth snow with its back warmed by the meagre glow of the floodlights. As I continued to peer at it through the half-light, its coarse features took on the characteristics of a face. Its gloomy, downcast eyes gazed at the snow, and I could discern a drooping moustache hanging beneath a nose-like outcrop. I retreated from the cold and returned to my room to prepare for breakfast. The land on which the data centre was to be built had been bought from the Swedish Forestry Agency in the 1960s and mined for sparse quantities of copper until 2012. Following this, the land made a brief recovery before being bought again at auction only three years later by the newly formed Moskosel Mine Consortium, with a view to capitalize on the rapidly growing data storage needs of the logistics industry. I had scrolled by the site numerous times on Google Street View. The images were 11 years old, and tire tracks from heavily loaded dump trucks were still visible in the mud. The site had a look of exhaustion about it. The red soil in the photospheres was relentlessly chewed up and pressed back into the earth by the tread of the tyre rubber. The small amount of copper ore had already been carted off and smelted down into wires to be shipped to factories across Sweden. After breakfast, I unpacked my equipment and laid it out on the bed. Piece by piece, I assembled the drone and total station and placed them by the door. I opened my laptop and once more briefly pivoted around the 3D landscape model that had been provided to me by the mining company. It had been made over 10 years ago and the resolution already dated it. The trees seemed to melt into the ground plane like hot wax, and the photographic textures were stretched across this uneven surface beyond any immediate recognition. 
I packed my rucksack and balanced the total station on my shoulder before heading back out into the bright morning. From the first day, it was clear that the 3D model contained many inaccuracies. It would be necessary to survey the entire site anew, starting with the plotting of the perimeter using the total station. I walked to the northern outskirts of the village, where a banner attached to a metal fence announced the enclosed terrain to be the property of the Moscow Cell Mine Consortium. For the rest of the day, I skirted this fence, recording its position every five meters as it ran first along the shores of the lake, then due west following the bank of a small creek, before snaking back to my starting point along an old logging road. The landscape had to be made machine readable. As I paced each transect with the GPS, I carefully recorded the height of the land, its contours, its features, and its anomalies. For the larger boulders, I meticulously outlined their shapes and positions. Everything had to be quantified and reconstituted from its organic to its digital form. Only then could it be flattened, the stream rerouted to cool the servers, and the cables laid to connect the buildings to the local grid and pipe the data in via fiber optic. I made notes and took photos of the topography to have later as reference images for the engineers. All this would eventually constitute a record a register of a landscape in its current state of growth or decay. At the beginning of my second week, a group of three researchers stayed for a night in the b, &B on their way back from an ice drilling expedition further north. They were transporting ice cores back to their university, where they would proceed to melt them in a vacuum to extract the gases that had been captured in air pockets 200,000 years ago. I asked to see one of the cores, which they agreed to with a certain reluctance. The information stored within the cores was extremely valuable, they explained, and could be key to predicting future patterns in climate change. What's more, they added, the source, a glacial field just over the border in Norway, was melting at a rate unheard of in the past 50 years of monitoring. As they drew the core slowly out of its metal canister, the ice seemed to emit light from deep beneath its surface. The placid smoothness of the cut exterior contained what looked like a chaotic matrix of bubbles and ash. After only a moment, they replaced it in its sheath, citing the risk of contamination. Later that night, I scrolled through the consortium's website trying to find some indication of what lay in store for the tract of land whose surface I had meticulously documented over the past week. There was nothing beyond the billboard claims of the logistics industry's first green data center, a new paradigm for sustainability, the key to the new data economy. The center would take advantage of the Arctic climate to naturally cool the servers and cut back on energy costs, which would then be passed down to the consumer it was clearly a website made not to transmit information, but to conceal it. I looked up at the lake and the mountains beyond, then closed my laptop and went down to get supplies for dinner at the supermarket. As I crossed the lot, I looked over to where the boulder whose features resembled a human face had been when I had first arrived. Instead of standing as it once had, it now appeared to have toppled over. No longer did its slanted peak rise dramatically out of the snow, but instead it lay on its side, its rocky back barely visible above the white. I walked over and inspected it from a few meters distance. No foot or tire prints had disturbed the surrounding snow. The boulder lay there as if it had always done so, unmoving and undisturbed. I bought supplies and returned to my room, for I soon forgot about this anomaly. At some point over the next few days, I realized that my initial measurements must be off. I cursed myself for not having properly calibrated the total station after the rough plane journey. I re-measured the base points I had been using thus far for the survey, and discovered they were off by several meters. I set out again around the perimeter fence, recording every five meters and double-checking the readings against my original measurements. It seemed that the original coordinates had distorted the site by inexplicable margins, placing the northwest corner in the lake while the eastern edge repeatedly cut through residents' lawns and driveways. Furious with myself, I resolved to work late into the night to correct the error. The transects too had to be completely redone, 
boulders and trees had leapt in my day to several meters from their true positions. Some seemed to disappear altogether the second time round, while a few large erratics appeared out of nowhere, having completely evaded my first sweep with the GPS. Even the shoreline of the lake seemed to have warped in comparison to my earlier readings, though this was imperceptible to the naked eye. This second sweep, however, also turned out to be riddled with inaccuracies. As soon as I tried to line up my ground readings with those taken aerially with the drone, nothing fit together any longer. The curvature of the land in either representation system was completely different. They each produced completely aberrant topographies that seemed to defy the carefully constructed knowledge the other system had produced. And yet, when I walked over the ground I had modelled now multiple times, it seemed as still as it had when I first arrived. Everything was covered in a thick layer of snow that remained undisturbed, except for the occasional animal prints. I began to stare at the forest outside my window for hours at a time, willing it to move in order to restore faith in my own methods. At a loss as to how to continue, I began to take the measurements once more, but was immediately struck by a sense of disorientation I had never before experienced. The terrain seemed to be constantly shifting beneath my feet. Although visibly the ground remained solid, my efforts felt akin to mapping waves on an ocean. Every time I turned away, the trees and boulders shifted into new configurations and then froze when I turned back to look. If I tried to retrace my steps along a particular transect, my footprints would disappear for several hundred meters before I could pick them up again in a location I could swear I had never mapped. At this point, I would retire back to the room, exasperated and exhausted from my efforts. By the end of the second week, I had accumulated a vast set of readings and survey points, assembled into a series of 3D models that I was not sure represented the landscape so much as my own psychological circumambulations. I sat at my laptop turning these models over and over again on the screen, examining them from all angles and at multiple resolutions. Each could have represented completely different locations. After a while, I closed the laptop and gazed out the window into the forest. Where the bracken gave way to the trees, some 200 meters from where I sat, there was a large boulder that had until now escaped my notice. As I peered longer at it, I felt I could make out its features, which resembled those of a ragged face. Long arms emerged from what looked like shoulders and dragged an otherwise disembodied head along the ground. As it moved into the forest, I lost sight of it, although by this point I couldn't be sure that I had seen it in the first place. When I woke in the morning, there was no longer any trace of it. I wrote up my report on the plane on the way back. I included a link to the latest 3D model I had produced as well as a full appendix of plans and elevations for the entire site. In a note to the engineers to whom I would give over the report, I made mention of the area's unstable geography and the difficulty in producing an accurate map of the area due to the resulting magnetic irregularities that had produced unexpected hardware problems. By the time the plane landed in Stockholm, I was certain that this is what must have happened. When I pulled the data up again a few days later, I couldn't fathom what had confused me in the first place. After all, how could the model possibly be wrong? It was an indelible record of what lay there at the moment of recording. I smiled to myself with this sudden realization. A landscape will inevitably transform and disappear. Only the model will live on.